Good morning on this beautiful autumn day. Good morning. I'm Doug Kimmel, one of the deacons on duty with Robin Long today. I pronounce a he and him. We welcome you to this pulpit this morning, the Reverend Dr. Kate Winters and the Reverend Joel Krieger. TJ was privileged to do her mentored practice with Kate and Joel at First Church in Belfast, from where they recently retired. Pastor TJ is in Wisconsin until October 31st. The time there will be split 50% vacation and 50% work. Next week, October 27th, we will be led by our student ministry intern, Serena Brooks. The Union Congregational Church of Hancock, in solidarity with other local UCC churches, will be holding peace and prayer vigils during the months of October and November. Come. Bring yourself, whoever you are, however you are feeling. Bring your worries, anxieties, hopes, and prayers for peace. This will be a time of quiet for prayers, meditation, reflection, or any other ways you seek to use this time and space. We will have printed prayers you may take, candles you can light for your prayers, and quiet music for reflection. Come and stay for a minute or the entire hour. All are welcome. Please extend the invitation to others that you know. We will offer the following times in which the sanctuary will be open. Monday, October 21st. Monday, November 4th. Monday, November 18th. From 1 to 2 p.m. Again, that's Monday the 21st. Next Monday, Monday, November 4th. The day before Election Day. And Monday, November 18th. From 1 to 2 p.m. All are invited to join a meditation group at 9 a.m. on Fridays in our sanctuary. The program will be led by Allison Bowden. That's 9 a.m. on Fridays here in the sanctuary. Please bring your returnable beverage cans and bottles to the church to support our campaign to provide snacks for students at the Hancock Grammar School. Call David Wilds at 422-3739 with any questions. You can also pick up your bottles and cans upon request. Thank you, David, for volunteering to do that. The Sunrise Association Fall Meeting will be held on November 2nd at 8.30 a.m. in Monroe. Are there any announcements from the congregation? As you all probably know, uh, early voting is now available in Maine, and that's a good way to avoid the uh, snowstorm on November 4th, if <laughs> whatever day it is. <laughs> and if you are visiting with us this morning, please sign our guest book at the rear of the sanctuary. We have some October birthdays and anniversaries. Today is the birthday of Ruth Dietze. Happy birthday, Ruth. Yay. <laughs> On the 24th is birthday for Susan Davies. On the 29th, Ron McGlinchey. And on the 30th, an anniversary for Chris and Melissa Noel. Now please let us center ourselves and prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
the bulletin says this is the welcome. However, I think it needs to be thank you for the welcome. <laughs> We're very happy to be here, very excited to be in TJ's church when she was with us for so long and it was such a delight. So thank you for having us and welcome. <laughs> Just want to say we We've been, of course, to your congregation, to your church many times before for meetings and, and other times, uh, other services. Mm -hmm. uh, we are good friends with TJ and Pat, and, and we do have another connection. I'm also from Wisconsin, oh. and we will soon be traveling that direction and actually might meet up with them while we're all out there. Um, and also, we are Green Bay Packer fans, I have to say. <laughs> um, and we share that with, with You're TJ. lucky I didn't wear gold. Yeah, well, or my Packer top. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we do have a game at one o'clock. Yeah. So. <laughs> so we bring you greetings from our now home church, the Lincolnville Center yeah. Church, um, United Christian Church, UCC. So let us continue our worship with our intro. remain standing for a call to worship printed in the bulletin. Brought here together by a great love. Let us engage in God's practices. Let us do justice in our worship. Holy in prayer, a world in torment. Let us show kindness to one another. Reaching out to others beyond our can. Let us walk humbly in step with our God. Brought here together by a great love. Let us embody compassion and joy. We will now pass the peace um, while Robin is lighting our candle. Peace be with you. as a prayer for peace. I'd like to read these words um, that I sent for our reflection. Uh, they move me and they move, move me to want and long for peace. In the dappled dawn, when creation breathes a still note, we find you, majesty, we are your witness. We are your voice in the wilderness. Our feet tread lightly, your mother ground. You made us like unto you, Bodhicitta, Holy Spirit, Atman, Ruwa. We are your body born in matter, gazing upon your own creation in us. Let us know peace in our hearts, in our community, in our nation, and in our world. Amen.
opening hymn is O God of Love, O God of Peace, in the New Century Hymnal, which is the Black Hymnal, number 571. join me in unison in the invocation printed in the bulletin. Shower us with love in this time together, Holy One. Bathe us in compassion, infuse us with patience and peace. Fill us with certainty of knowing that we are one in you. In other words, drench us with your spirit that we may speak your words and engage in your healing action this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So today we wanted to talk a little bit about it. It's a, a, a word um, that you may not know. Um, the word is marginal. Does anybody know what marginal means? On the edge. On the edge. Is oh, on the edge. edge. Very good. Tell, tell them you don't hear. Yeah, I, I don't hear real well. So, so um, if, if I don't respond correctly, or if you say something and I'm looking, you know, that's, that's what's going on. Anybody else? Any, any thoughts about what, what it means to be marginal? Separated. Separated. Okay. On the edge. On the edge. Hidden. 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 Okay. One thing, if, if we did have children here, I would probably first start by saying, just to start, make sure we're not talking about that stuff that you spread on your toes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different margin. Margin <laughs> right, yes, yes. No. But yeah, so marginal. And, and marginal is, is something that happens to people sometimes. Sometimes we find ourselves on the margins, or, or we talk about people being marginalized. One way to, to talk about, and, and, and I want to talk about how that feels. What does it feel like? on the edge, or not included. Vicki, do you have any thoughts about, about what that feels like? Bad. It feels bad, that's right, that's right. Separate. Yeah. 
What I'd like to do is, is ask the four volunteers. Oh. Just four volunteers to come up front here. Oh. Yep. Just come up. We need one more. Oh, here we go. We, we're set. We're all set. Yep. And if the four of you would join hands together, make a little circle. Now, Vicki, I'm sorry. No, no, no. 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 So, no. If, so, well, the four. The four the so, so we have four, and they're, they're a happy little group, right? right. <laughs> but we have one that's on, on the edge, on the outside. And Vicki is marginalized, because she's not a great one. And, 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 and so, Vicki, what, what is that like to be outside the group? I don't like it. Yeah. I don't want to be part of it. That's right. And that's, that's how things are supposed to be. We, we should all be yeah. a part. So, but, but, you know, sometimes, sometimes what <laughs> happens is, is, we, is, is our group will sometimes say, well, we are very inclusive, so let's have Vicky in. But you know what sometimes happens, Vicky, what if you get in the middle of the circle? Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes we can marginalize people even by taking them in. So, so the group, they might do their thing around, they might be having fun, and they say Vicky's inclusive, but she's really not, because she's not a part of the group. She may not have power to, to help make change or do things differently. Vicki is still marginalized, even though we are saying we're taking her in. But when Vicki joins the group and is invited to be a part of, of that group in all, of, in all respects, then things are good. Vicki, how does that feel? Yeah, much better. I don't want to be in the middle anymore. Very good. Very good. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So that's our lesson. And, and the, of course, we know in the church, Vicki and all, that Christ calls us to include all, to not, to not marginalize, but in fact to reach out to those who are marginalized and and who don't feel a part of, of our society, part of our stru social structure, or especially a part of our church. So we got to do our best to reach out and include. Okay? Okay. All right. <laughs> well, I always like to have a little prayer with our, our young people. So could I hold you? Let's pray together. Oh, gracious God, we thank you for all the ways that you, you give us love and kindness and compassion and all the things that help us to reach out, especially to those who are feeling marginalized, feeling on the edge, feeling not included. Help us to, to live your love and to, to, to extend our hands and our hearts to everyone around us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Kate made sure that I read our reading beforehand for today because you've got a few names. It's one of those. We're looking at the passage from 2 Samuel, the 21st chapter. Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years year after year. And David inquired of the Lord. The Lord said, There is blood guilt on Saul and on his house because he put the Gibeonites to death. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not people of Israel but of the remnant of the Amorites 
although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them. Saul had tried to wipe them out in his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. David said to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? How shall I make expiation that, that you may bless the heritage of the Lord? The Gibeonites said to him, it is not a matter of silver or gold between us and Saul or his house. Neither is it for us to put anyone to death in Israel. He said, what do you say that I should do for you? And they said to the king, the man who consumed us and planned to destroy us so that we should have no place in all the territory of Israel, let seven of his sons be handed over to us and we will impale them before the Lord at Gibeon on the mountain of the Lord. The king said, I will hand them over. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Saul's son, Jonathan, because of the oath of the Lord that was between them, between David and Jonathan, son of Saul. The king took the two sons of Rizpah, daughter of Aiah, whom she bore to Saul, Armoni and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Merab, daughter of Saul, whom she bore to Adriel, son of Bazar Barzilla, the Meholathite. He gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they impaled them on the mountain before the Lord. The seven of them perished together. They were put to death in the first days of harvest, at the beginning of the barley harvest. Then Rizpah, the daughter of Ayah, took sackcloth and spread it on a rock for herself from the beginning of harvest until rain fell on them from the heavens. She did not allow the birds of the air to come on the bodies by day or the wild animals by night. When David was told what Rizpah, daughter of Aya, the concubine of Saul, had done, David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan from the people of Jabesh Gilead, who had stolen them from the public square of Beth Shan, where the Philistines had hung them up on the day the Philistines killed Saul on Gilboa. He brought up from there the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan, and they gathered the bones of those who had been impaled. They buried the bones of Saul and of his son Jonathan in the land of Benjamin in Zila, in the tomb of his father Kish. They did all that the king commanded, after that, God heeded supplications for the land. Our contemporary reading comes from Abraham Joshua Heschel, Impatience with Injustice, from his book, I Asked for Wonder. Turning from the discourses of the great metaphys metaphysicians to the orations of the prophets, one may feel as if they are going down from the realm of the sublime to an area of trivialities. Instead of dealing with the timeless issues of being and becoming, of matter and form, of definitions and demonstrations, one is thrown into orations about widows and orphans, about the corruption of judges and affairs of the marketplace. The prophets make so much ado about paltry things, employing the most excessive language and speaking about flimsy subjects. So what if somewhere in ancient Palestine, poor people have not been treated properly by the rich? Why such immoderate excitement? Why such intense indignation. Their breathless impatience with injustice may strike us as hysteria, 
We ourselves witness continually acts of injustice, manifestations of hypocrisy, falsehood, outrage, misery that we rarely get indignant or overly excited. To the prophets, a minor, commonplace sort of injustice assumes almost cosmic proportions. <coughs> so ends our readings for this morning. these glasses I can read the text better when I'm higher. There. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you, O oh God, for you are the source of our hope and all our joy. Amen. Your pastor, TJ, uh, told me before I prepared this that you use a different lectionary than we have, um, than I have for the last over 30 years. And, uh, I, and she told me it would, was prepared by a Dr. Willa Gaff, uh, Wilda Gaffney and that it centers women in the Bible. And I thought, great, <laughs> this is gonna be fun until she sent me the readings. Yeah. <laughs> that was quite a reading, that first one. Um, I was immediately, I knew, in dangerous territory as I wrestled with this scripture, and I did wrestle with this scripture. 
because we too now live in a culture of active violence. The peoples of the time vied not only for survival, but for dominance in the land that they inhabited. Sound familiar? The God that appears is often portrayed uh, in the people's image, not the other way around. The God of vengeance, supporting retribution. My initial response to the readings was an anguished, how long? How long must humankind live with such chaos? How long will be so short-sighted as to think that what we do to others won't immediately come back to us? Or better yet, what we do to others is what we do to ourselves. Surely the story of the Israelites and the surrounding peoples this morning sound eerily contemporary. From the blood guilt, only now on Hamas, for the slaughter of the young festival goers last October, and the avenging army of Israel taking on all of Gaza, and now Hezbollah and Lebanon. I can't believe when I first read the reading, I, I guess I was, that the Gibeonite response to uh, David was actually more civilized than the countries. All they wanted to avenge their death were the seven sons to be handed over, to be impaled probably crucified um, on the mountain of the Lord. That's all they wanted. They were not demanding total annihilation as are violence addicted leaders today. How did I ever think ever that we were advancing as a species? I mean, this is 3,000 years ago. Now, of course, the Gibeonites' response was not, hardly a civilized solution for Rizpah, mother of two of Saul's sons, and uh, for Merib, who is the mother of five of Saul's sons who were sent to their horrific deaths. All they had to experience was the annihilation of their families. They were merely pawns in a man's game of evening up a score. I had believed that we had come a long way from the time when the purpose, primary purpose of women was to provide children to populate the patriarchy with no say as to what would happen to them. I thought we were far away from that. Was this merely wishful thinking? Sadly, I have no children. We haven't had children. Um, and I am hearing much too much in public lately, questioning my purpose and place in life. Too much. Everything from not doing my part to not being as worthy as others, to not even being as humble. Now women may roll their eyes and laugh at such obsolete thoughts being resurrected these days. But let me tell you, these comments hit their mark burdening even the strongest of us with the fear that life is more dangerous and less stable than we might have thought for us. There still remain forces in our world 
that do not believe us to be as equal, strong, or free, that we shouldn't be. And we need to take this seriously. What do they call it, a slippery slope? We really need to take it seriously. Now let's get back to the scripture. Does it have any guidance for us today? In a culture where the power is top down and absolute, it is important to look at the people in the margins. What are they doing? What's happening with them? What was happening with Vicki? And this is where women are doing what they need to do. Rispa, in that culture, had no power to keep her children safe in the monarchy. She had no power. But this does not mean that she is without recourse. Even in her grief, grief can be a very powerful motivator. Even in her grief, Rizbash has the courage um, to respond in a way that will be noticed not only by the king and will move him to react in more humane ways, gathering the bones and taking care of the bodies. But also God is moved to heed the prayer of the suffering. She did that. Rispa refuses to be the victim and instead becomes a witness. A witness to the sacredness of life, living and dead. A witness to the grief that is inflicted by agreements made by those in power. Those seeking only to even the score between peoples without compassion or even recognition of the lives destroyed. Rizba calls to us from 3,000 years ago to do what it is we still can do as our nation and our world seems to be spiraling into more and more chaos and too many innocents are sacrificed. This woman found a way to make a difference in a culture that set her up to be invisible. She refused to accept that for herself. And now I ask, in a minute, are any of you feeling invisible or powerless in these times. I know that I've been walking around in a bit of a haze, not feeling fully engaged or seen, struggling to know how to respond to the nation's challenges today. The atmosphere of hostility frightens me, and fear tends to render us more and more invisible. We're afraid of stepping out or stepping on toes. Having recently retired from the first church in Belfast, well, it's almost two years now, but it doesn't feel that long, um, I have learned some things. Retirement hasn't been easy, mainly for me because of health problems, and I thank you all for your prayers, as I know TJ was praying for me at that time. But also from a sense of having lost a recognized role in the community and even in the church. For pastors, as you know, I'm sure, there is the expectation that you become invisible in your former beloved church community. We were there for 18 years. 
but we were meant to become invisible in a place where we once had a strong presence and a voice. Speak about having to move to the margins. On top of that, there is that aging component. <laughs> Any of you know about that? Yeah. In these last two years, while I've been recuperating, what I've been doing is a lot of praying and researching um, on the issue of aging in our culture. I have heard from multiple sources how older people can tend to feel invisible, not seen, not needed, and not acknowledged, at least in the way they used to be. Kind of like the woman in patriarchy who fails to deliver the expected child. Through my research and prayer, I have learned how short-sighted this marginalization of the aged is. In fact, I have come to believe that it is only as elders reclaim their purpose and power and are re-centered in spheres of influence that we are to heal our terribly turbulent world. Why? Now this message would be much too long if I went into it too far. And you would never invite me back. So, um, But here's an essential nugget of it. Humankind has evolved to live 20 to 30 years longer than we did just a century ago. We all have, well, we don't all, but many of us have these extra years. Evolution is not useless, purposeless change. It always has a purpose to the benefit of the species. There's a purpose to these years. What are they for? When I studied faith development back in grad school um, through the lifespan in my doctoral work, I felt it was pretty much da well documented, you know, faith development, moral development, all kinds of development through the lifespan until you get to the elder years. Then there was a deficit of information. I've come to the conclusion that these years are for spiritual development and it must take center stage as other responsibilities have lessened. There is so much we need to do in the spiritual domain, although up to now, we have had very few models for it. Well, we have a couple, but we all think, oh, I can't be Gandhi, or I can't be Bishop Tutu, or Mother Teresa. But we need to have everyday models of it. Um, and this is what is required to bring all people to the saving grace we need, knowing that it is our divisions that are killing us. Only once you've experienced the oneness of all of life, and not just talked about it, like we all could say we're all one, yeah, but truly experienced the oneness of all of life in development and in practice, you have attained a potent and active wisdom that this world needs for its healing. Some call it Christ consciousness, but it's certainly not solely a Christian endeavor. It is a universal, even cosmic spiritual awareness, an awareness that cannot divide the world into us and them, it cannot exact vengeance on anyone since there are no others. All are one. Love is truly what we are made of. We are all meant to be and can all become 
profoundly wise spiritual beings for the sake of the world. So I end this message with a call, particularly to elders. There are some of us here. We may have our most important work to do ahead of us, not behind us. Not staying in the margins like Rizpa, we must reject invisibility that our culture cloaks us in and become strong witnesses to the oneness of being. For then, there are no margins, there are no victims, and we are all centered in God's love. This is what these years are for, our evolution into healed and whole humanity. So let's get to it. Amen. Please rise either in spirit or body for the next hymn, Spirit of Love, number 56. be seated. As we prepare our hearts and minds to be in the time of prayer together, I invite you to hear these concerns uh, for this week, that we, those that we want to be remembering in our hearts. 
Let's have prayers for Ron's brother, Joe, for Kathy's brother, David, both receiving radiation or chemotherapy treatments for cancer. Prayers for Donald B. and Kenny V. and Oric of Golden Acres. Prayers for Serena's dad, James Brookman. Sierra, as she learns to navigate a recent diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. Everett's sister, Libby, recently diagnosed with lung cancer. Judith C., Don and Heather, Bruce's sister, Lynn, Sally's friend, uh, Sue Barger, Dr. John, Yvonne, Herbie Lounder, Ira, Kathy C., Jane, Ruth, Marie, Doris, Ron and Kathy, Jim Snyder, Jonathan Holmes, Brandon Perry Hudson, John Wood, Sue Davies, Sue Davenport, Liz and Jim, Kenny Stratton, Joy and David and Lori and Melissa. Debbie and Lincoln and son-in-law Aaron, daughter Ashley and granddaughter Brielle. Sandy Fippen. Betty and her stepdaughter Molly. Debbie and Hollis and Holly and Debbie's aunt Linda Reed. Amy Nickerson. Tom and Judy's son Andrew and family. Kevin and Vanessa, Vanessa and family. And prayers of strength and healing for all awaiting diagnoses and for all recovering from surgeries and procedures. Prayers for all that are unsafe, unhoused, hungry, and in need of care and compassion. Prayers for all caregivers and prayers for all that is in your heart. And that's a long list of, of prayer concerns. But uh, I believe, do you also then accept prayer concerns yeah, from the congregation? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and I'm gonna let Kate hear for me <laughs> since I might not catch all of it, so. Um, for our friend's son, Keith, who was about to start um, rehab. Okay, for Keith. For Andrea at the Golden Acres, who's busy working today and cannot be with us. For Andrea, who can't be with us. I'm going to change it a little bit. I got a joy. It was a joy for some of us that spent the weekend at Pilgrim Lodge with the main conference annually. Uh, it's always a phenomenal time and I would suggest if anybody gets asked to be a delegate um, by all means take it up. You meet friends and new acquaintances that you never would get a chance to meet other than at these events. And it was so beautiful there. <laughs> I have the joy I brought my mom home from the hospital hey. yesterday. Hey. Um, we know what is going on and it can be treated, so we're very grateful. Um, and her little house and her big heart is open for visits. Oh, like to see her. And she's getting to know the new puppy. Ah. <laughs> it's a joy for me to join you in worship. I'm from the Bar Harbor Congregational Church and I'm friends with Joel and Kate and Vicki and had the pleasure of spending the weekend with them at Pilgrim Lodge for annual meeting. And part of the reason I'm here today is because your dear Vicki drove me home because yeah. I can't see at night. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I, it's a joy to be here with you today. And we just thought you wanted to see us. <laughs>
I would like to uh, a joy. Joel and I celebrated this week our 30th wedding anniversary. We made it this far. Hopefully we'll make it another. Maybe another 30 years? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll be well spiritually well, developed. <laughs> I invite you then to quiet your hearts and minds and let's seek to be in communion with one another here as we commune with the Spirit of God present with us here in this holy place. Let's pray. <clears throat> Most gracious and loving God, we come to you lifting up all these concerns and joys, all the thoughts and prayers that we put before you, asking for your presence in these places and with these people, asking for your powers of healing to engage in their bodies and their minds, asking that you might bring compassion and comfort, and to be with those who are lonely and those who are suffering. O oh God, we ask that you help us through the powers that we have to, to reach out and to include, that none feel left out or left behind. And O oh God, we pray for our world, we pray for our nation, we pray for our leaders, that your spirit might move them all to, to ways of love and, and kindness, to humility, that we might join uh, all people together in a world where, where now it seems chaos and violence seem to reign. We pray especially, O oh God, for those in places of, of war, for the innocent lives who've been lost, for the many who have gone homeless, houses and homes destroyed, for those seeking peace. And God, we thank you for the ways in which you touch each of our individual lives, for the beauty of this world around us, for nature, for the seasons, for this wonderful time of autumn where leaves turn and that we live in a place that is so blessed. The ground, the trees, the creatures, everything is a marvel to us. And gracious God, we thank you for the things that we receive each and every day, our food, our shelter, the love of family and friends. All these things, O oh God, and all that we hold deep within our hearts, we lift up to you now as we pray the prayer of Christ that reminds us we are all indeed one family, one great family, children of yours together as we pray. Our Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory.
would just remind you what we all know each and every time that this this part of the service comes and we are blessed we are a blessed people it's hard to to recognize but when we read about history and the ways people have lived throughout the centuries we know that we are we live like royalty once thought they could live we have so much food every day homes that are secure social structures and cities and towns that are safe to live in we are truly a blessed people so as we give today give for, so that we might work together for the ministry of this church let's do so with gratitude and thanksgiving in our hearts may the offering be taken join together in our prayer of dedication bless these gifts of our hearts holy one and multiply them into blessings for the world beginning here among us all we have is meant to share as all has been gifted by you and there is such joy in the sharing amen our final hymn is sent forth by god's blessing one of our favorites let's sing it with some gusto
receive the benediction, do you mostly go out that way or this way? That way, right, coffee. <laughs> okay. Receive the benediction. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you with kindness and give all of us peace. Amen. Hi there. Good morning from Pennsylvania. From Pennsylvania. Wow. Yes. That's great. Hi. Yeah. Thank you. Lovely service. Very nice. Well, yeah. Thank you. So glad you could join us. Hey, Carol. Hey.